Hello and welcome back to What's in an OP? The show that I created on my channel, which is the channel that you are watching at this moment. Some of the first episodes of this show that I, the professional shitbag, made like four years ago were about the small and mostly unknown show JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. That blatantly ripped off the show that we are about to cover today. As all of my 900,000 subscribers know, this series takes a look at all sorts of anime OPs and discusses how much detail there actually may be beyond what lies at the surface. Since these 90 seconds aren't just for showing credit, which the endings already do, it is crucial for the opening to try to encase the premise of the anime, while at the same time hyping us up for the episode that is to come. This millennium, I, the person that I am, will be taking a look at the ongoing series that took the world, or should I say all worlds, by storm. I'm of course talking about Beel Snack and its quirkiness. The narrative structure and pure creativeness of 365 Solar System Karma Earth Globe Studios really shines through in this masterpiece. From Beel Snack's humble beginnings as a vaguely recognizable new show to the now ongoing season 3C. For the normal human eye, the show really doesn't seem to be that unique. But as its cult following most certainly will tell you, it's really not that simple. But today, I'm not here to talk about the show per se, so let's get started with the opening for the opening of the series, the season that started it all, season 1, Fading Life. The Fading Life OP starts off with a bunch of panel-like shots, foreshadowing characters and objects that further on in the series become well-known staples from the hero's wacky adventures. Afterwards, it changes to the star of the show, 3 or C star. We then stay stationary in a dim lit generic tunnel as the title appears, after which we burst into the foyer of a stylized fictional mansion. As the drum kicks, we see one of the series' hallmarks, the fact that only one distinct object moves at any given time, for the most part at least. There are a lot of literal edits in this OP. For example, when Leif 42 sees about vlogs, we are present in this fictional mansion, which we all know vloggers are notorious for living inside. Even the lyrics pay tribute to Bill Snack's legacy, framing the protagonist's search for the ultimate YouTube exploit as a search of great magnitude, sung in a rock ballad, not unlike the devil went down to Georgia. Hugo pops out of the wall, bringing us to a brilliantly framed shot. Hugo focuses on Nemo and scans his quote-unquote enemy, mirroring his alien nature and the fact that he doesn't know anything about the outer world, and that he therefore needs to scan his surroundings to learn everything he has missed. While Nemo is center stage as an earthling, Hugo dominates the frame, saying that where he came from, there exists bigger problems and larger threats that may be dangerous for anyone from this world to come in contact with. We can see from the framing and their contrasting color schemes and the crisscrossing stairs they stand on that two are diametrically opposed. Even the movement of Hugo echoes Nemo's still posture, bringing into attention the dilemma of the immovable object versus the unstoppable force, further emphasizing this dichotomy. The linearity of Hugo is contrasted with his ship moving, as if broken, which it is. The ship's movements cut to Leo activating the Daytorn by rubbing his paw in a diagonal sinusoidal pattern, and then finally into the money with which Leo buys his and Nemo's traveling hatch from the store, the catalyst for finding the Daytorn in the first place. All three objects are weapons in their own right, with the money representing capitalism, Daytorn representing technology, and the ship representing resources. Much of the OP is built around recreating famous scenes from the logs, using everyone in re flesh and blood so to make it authentic. Here we see Leo kicking Nemo, as they were stuck in what they called hell. And this iconic kick sends Nemo's life literally spiraling, but ultimately we see Nemo confronting Leo with another attack, reflecting upon the rivalry that may exist between friends. However, Leo's actions inadvertently make them find the Daytron as well, activating the most illogical power at their disposal. Afterwards, we move back to when Leo and Nemo move the Hugo's interplanetary spaceship. We see how the ship went flying even though it didn't work any longer, and then how it lands in the exact same place as before. This is trying to symbolize how you sometimes only need a little bit of effort to move forward, 
while at the same time showing how everything one puts effort into is a gamble of whether you fall flat or succeed in your plans. It then foreshadows the fact that our hero's actions result in the complete annihilation of both their houses and Hugo's UFO in a fire. In one or more melancholy scenes in the series, Hugo is seen walking away from the grassy field that, up to that point, was the most important spot in Bysnack. He is showing that he won't stand with the inappropriate behavior that caused the destruction of what he loved, and the memories held within his spacecraft, smoothly explaining his absence from most of Bysnack as a whole. The opening thereafter jumps to a one-way storytelling montage of both important and unimportant scenarios from the season, with one-way meaning that you probably won't see the difference until you watch the whole season, which many OPs do to an extent. The town of Botkiga is seen, but overshadowed by something. I believe this something is representing the manipulation that Illuminati, as Loomis, tried to do, which I think was done as early as season 1, if not earlier. But hey, this isn't a set theory video, and we all know what happened to Loomy Boy that worked for us in the first place, right? Please watch season 3 of Bill Snake and of course season 1 and 2, please 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 we have no money. We see a powered up Leo enter the frame, facing a menacing staircase with the text enemy stand question mark question mark question mark appearing, as this season heavily tries to establish our beloved characters, whereas an overlying story with a bad guy, which by the OP is called the enemy stand, is being absent. The shot purposely works against the high tempo of the song, giving a slow build up as Leo prepares the day turn and then expands with his powers. This last shot of Nemo standing menacingly with a knife is spectacular, even though it's based on Nemo's own side series Super Shenanigans, where he one time got possessed and stabbed Leo with this precise knife. The shot then gives away to a final montage of pictures, some representing polarizations like good and evil and earth and hell. Nemo and Leo then lock themselves into the final attack for the hype factor, since this shot never actually happens in Bysnack. Before the hit connects, we zoom out from the shot. And as a finale, we see how the camera gets pulled out from Dayton, which falls onto a generic school corridor. And that is all for this episode of Watching an OP. Tune in next time as we analyze the abstract visuals of Season 2's OP, Show of Idiots. Please subscribe and watch our earlier episodes, totally not made by Mother's Basement. I'll see you on the dick side, shut it up! <laughs>